so there. Alrighty, shall we officially get started? Yeah. Hi. Hi, I'm Chris. <laughs> and I'm Cherie. And, and we're, we're experts. And, and we are Technomadia. We are the experts <laughs> in all things nomadic living, whether it's RV, <laughs> boat, zeppelin, spaceship. We are the world experts in living in um, small uh, things, places. That's a places joke, the by road. the way, if you're just uh, tuning in. It's actually, we were on a uh, trawler group just about an hour ago, and someone was asking for recommendations of YouTube channels of boaters. And, and so this person it. replied saying, you know, here's a couple channels, and I really hate Technomadia. They just bought a boat a week ago, and now they're pretending to be experts. Um, yeah. Okay, so <laughs> if you think that we are experts at boating, I am so sorry that you were tuning in, because we are not. We have owned our boat less than six months. We are complete newbies. We are still learning. And what we are doing here is we are sharing our transition from RVing and boating and back and forth right. and what we're learning. And so, maybe you can learn things from that. Maybe we're experts at being newbies. Well, and we'd been on and living in <laughs> Mobley and being RVers and full-time nomads for 11 years now, um, over, basically. And so we are really good at living in small spaces. We're really good at um, off-grid living and power conservation and a lot of things. But then there's a whole new angle that comes from being on a boat. And we are not pretending to be experts about a boat. Our prior boating experience is sitting right back there. It's an inflatable an, kayak. Yes, that's our prior boating experience. So we are boating newbies. We are not trying to be anything but. But what we are experts at or we have lots of experience with is RVing beforehand and we know a lot of our audience are our RVers and are maybe considering boating or we just want to know what the differences are and we know we have a lot of new folks tuning in who are boaters who might be considering RVing in the future so hopefully that this transition phase for us might be helpful to right. others we've got fresh eyes and um, we're just sharing it and we're di we like to share that I mean that's what we've been doing forever and apparently that's why people like to watch us on occasion so all right yay. We, we appreciate that <laughs> so. all right so this evening what we wanted we just completed seven Night nights straight days, yeah. mm -hmm. of uh, anchoring out as we came down the Keys and a couple of nights before that. So we like nine nights in the last two weeks. Yeah, so and um, it's not our first time anchoring, but it is definitely our most extended yet. Right. And it was not just in one place. This was, you know, hopping about, going to new territory, moving into uncharted waters for us um, as we move from um, you know, southwest Florida down into the Keys. So and was, those was, will be caught up in our travelogue videos really soon. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and we have years of experience with RV boom docking. We yes. have done lots of it all over the country in three different RVs, all outfitted for solar and off-grid living. And what we wanted to talk about this evening was just sharing some of the things that we're finding are similar and which are different. And, and very different in some cases. So yeah. All right. So, you know, why they are similar is they are free, uh, most usually free, um, yes. just because mm -hmm. you are going to a place that is usually a public land uh, or waterway. Public waterways. And there's actually some really great permissive laws about you can anchor in a lot of places, actually more than you can for boondocking. And boondocking, there's a lot on national lands, like right. the BLM, the Bureau of Land Management. There's um, national forests. There's some county yeah. and state parks that also allow it as well. Um, and there's other, there's a whole bunch of places where our readers can go. And yeah. so that is the, one of the similarities is free, and we all like free. And and often, actually, we've always raved about some of our favorite boondocking spots in the RV were some of the most, not, not totally aside from free, they would be the, even if we were paying... They're the most resort-like to us because we like big, yeah. expansive, beautiful views. They're our favorite places. They're amazing. These would be a $1,000 a night campsites if we could afford that, but they're free. I mean, it, it, they're like million-dollar views, but they're free. And that's yeah. We got a lot of that same experience anchoring mm -hmm. out. And isolation, being on mm -hmm. your own. For those of us that are more introverted or like okay. to take a break from social opportunities, don't like people walking right outside of our homes, it, boondocking and anchoring out give you that feeling of being out there on your own and being a little more self-sufficient. So the, those are similarities. There is a bit of a spectrum too, though, because mm -hmm. just like there's blacktop boondocking, la la, you know, camp at a Walmart or boondock in a downtown or urban area, you can do the same thing with a boat. We got a little bit of experience of that, of anchoring out in a suburban area with condos all around us and a grocery store that mm -hmm. was a short putter away. So instead of walking to the Walmart, we got to putter into a grocery store. So there's some really interesting there's similarities there too, yeah. yeah. Um, Self-containment is another of the similarities. In both of them, you're not being hooked up to power, you're not being hooked up to water, and you don't have a dump station or pump out station. Or trash right dumpsters handy. Right, you are self-sufficient. 
um, with being anchored out or boondocking. Um, and so that means that you need to be prepared for that. You need to have your own power source, whether that's batteries, running a generator, having solar, a wind turbine, a hamster wheel. You okay, I guess that could work. Yeah, for our cat wheel, it would probably yeah, work, yeah. but that'd be pretty lazy. Nap, 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 back and forth. I guess a bicycle. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you need to be, be set for set for your providing for all your own amenities and of course your own internet, of, you know, absolutely essential. Um, but there are a few differences in how these come together, like what's the strength and weaknesses. Um, wind power is an example. Wind power is very rarely used in RVs because you try to park, you know, there's not a lot of uh, constant wind. You need a constant wind source and not the places you want to RV tend to be in the windy places where... Yeah you're going to want to but boom dock. On the water, there's often a constant ocean breeze that is perfect for wind coastal. power. coastal. Yeah, coastal areas. So there's a lot more boats get away with wind power where we've only seen like one or two RVs it's over rare, much rare, 10 years much that have even tried to do wind power. Um, um, solar is uh, prevalent in both boom docking and uh, boating. Solar is more popular with sailboats than uh, motorboats like we have, but we will be joining the few that are out there and, yeah, uh, and we, adding solar. We've been actually spent the last 24 hours planning our solar system, so hopefully all that will come together soon. Um, and uh, generators are prevalent in both, mm -hmm. of course, and you, they go the spectrum of nicely integrated ones that are soundproofed and quiet. Ours on the boat is, ours on our bus slightly is, to those that are more contractor janky. generator, we call them janky, yep. loud generators we, that we, annoy you. We've been to anchorages where somebody's got a, mm -hmm. a big contractor generator strapped to the their foredeck and uh you, just, you know just, everyone's trying to enjoy a nice quiet evening and you hear that echoing of the generator and, everywhere you get that in an RVing, you get same that in the, the, the wonderful boondocking spot you're looking at the stars there's nobody around somebody pulls up 300 yards from you turns on the cranky generator oh <laughs> uh, so, ruins your day so you get that as well um, um water huge difference in water fresh water fresh water i mean we all get our fresh water usually Usually in um, boating and RVing, we go to a campground, we go to a gas station, we go to a house, we fill up from the city water well, we may be, yeah. or we may be, yeah. uh, fill it up. Um, a difference with boaters is a lot of boats, especially those that are made for ocean crossings and coastal cruising, tend to have water makers on board, which takes salty, clean water, desalinates it, and creates fresh water on board. And if you've got excess power, you basically have infinite water, and you know we. We, we know people who say that they just basically they cannot use enough water. It's just there more than they can handle, which is a good problem to have. And RVers never have that problem when you're boondocking. You're always in super survey. scarce water mode. Um, we do not have a water maker on board. Our yeah. boat is more of a uh, design for bays. It's a bay liner. Yeah, not um, open salty waters. And we don't. We're not going to have access as o very often to that clean salty water. Now we do transition to Caribbean cruises and things like that. Might be something to look yeah. into yeah. at that time. Particularly because in the Caribbean, water costs a lot, mm -hmm. whereas yeah. marina yeah. water yeah. tends to be free, free. free or cheap. Um, uh, wastewater is a difference. Um, in RVs, um, you have a holding tank that holds your toilet water and your gray water, so things coming from your sink and your um, showers. Mm -hmm. In boats, your gray water, most of them are set up so it just plums right overboard. It just goes overboard for right. the gray water. Black water also has a holding tank. Um, and then you have to find pump out stations mm -hmm. or like in, in RVing, dump stations to deal with it later. Um, however, in boating, you can go a certain number of miles offshore. Usually, it's three miles. Here, down where we are right now in the, miles. the Keys, it's nine miles. And then just dump into the ocean because you know that's where the sore plants kind of put it to anyway. So it's um, we haven't done this yet, but it's a lot of boaters uh, do that. They plan their trips to make sure they head out far enough offshore and then back in, mm -hmm. and that's an yeah, opportunity dump to dump their tanks. We're not going to have that opportunity very often on the Great Loop because we'll be in rivers and yes. intercoastal and things like that, but. It is an option if we need it. Um, and of course, composting toilets are options on both boats mm -hmm. and RVs. Um, and you're seeing a lot of off-grid RVers choosing it. A lot of sailboaters use composting toilets. Mm -hmm. And we are actually considering one. We have two heads on our boat. <laughs> we are considering one of them, uh, changing one of them out to be a composting toilet just for the flexibility. The flexibility and being, yeah, having a different kind of redundant system that is mm -hmm. not tied to a tank potentially mm -hmm. being full. Is that it for um, self-containment? That's self-containment. Oh, no, one other thing. This it's trash. This trash is, is um, you often, when you're boondocking, you don't have an opportunity to 
get rid of your trash easily, and we are loving a lot of very rare on both boats and RVs, but we, we ours happen to have a trash compactor, and we fall in love with it. We never thought we'd we thought we were gonna tear it out, put storage in. We basically <laughs> last took the trash out when we left Fort Myers at the beginning of August, and we just threw it out yesterday. It, it just goes <laughs> and goes. It's kind of like a bottomless pit of trash. Just and goes it, in. It didn't smell. We we, we try to keep the uh, fresh produce and stuff bad produce out so it's not rotting in there but it's an incredible way to store your trash um whereas in boondocking we we're always like we would have to make runs into town to or find a dumpster or we'd big, have big trash bags tied to our bumper and stuff just mm -hmm. to stuff things yeah. here and there but having it just disappear in a small bag has been wonderful it's been awesome okay so the next one is the next similarity is both of them require researching in advance and there are awesome tools to help you with yes. that so with rv boondocking there are great sites that list known boondocking sites. Uh, Campendium is our favorite. Uh, they list both paid campgrounds and the free boondocking mm -hmm. area, so it's a great compilation of them so you can find yeah. those options. Uh, All States has got some boondocking spots they've and, been uh, adding, and mm -hmm. free campsites. Freecampsites.net is another one run by some other uh, full-time RVers that we've known for a long right. time. Um, and then there's, you know, if you're going to go a little bit kind of broader and scout things out from there, our own app, U.S. Public Lands, is actually a good way to do your homework on now, finding you know, your own unique finding locations. Your own unique forgot we wrote an app for that. Yes, we did write an app um, for that. And then uh, for in boating, uh, some of the three top resources tend to be Active Captain, which is more of a user generated and submitted resource, more similar to, uh, I guess, kind of like the Campanium. Uh, Waterway Guides is more of the commercially listed one where they are listing them. And uh, Skipper Bob's is an independently Published, published every one. year guide. Guide. And um, and and these 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 descriptions people just add on. It's it's sometimes it's a lot more complicated for anchoring spots because you're trying to navigate terrain that you cannot see underwater. And the guide the in, the advice on getting into an anchorage might say come only at high tide, stick over to here, stay really far to the left, act like you're about to run onto the beach, then turn hard right. And you know, then you'll find deep water. Throw your anchor down, well protected. And you're like, oh, okay, this is kind of exciting. Let's hope, let's hope we don't run aground going in here. You make sure your depth sounder is working yes. really well too. Um, in boondocking, it's really common, especially if you're going to a new area that you don't know, that you park your RV kind of off the road in a safe place. Maybe get unhook your toad if you have a vehicle or, or bike, bike or yeah. walk it, and go find your spot. Make sure the ground is firm enough for you that there's no big it, steep climb that you're going to have to get over. It's really awful to get get a big RV stuck in a sandy boondocking area that you're going to have the hardest time getting towed out of. So do, it's so pays off to go scout it in advance. It's a little bit harder to do that um, on the water because there's no place to park your boat before you yeah, get you can, to the you anchorage. Can just park, you, know, you can anchor the boat if there's a safe place to anchor outside and, the anchorage. But if, if there's it, not. <laughs> if there's not or the conditions aren't good for it, that makes it difficult. Uh, you can let one person go with the dinghy ahead of you and the other person can hold station which is basically yeah. just using the engines to try to stay in one spot um, and then one option that we found is we found the kind of our first anchorage we got there and then we got out his drone yeah and we got up a, a nice aerial view and then scoped out the area and we could actually see the shallow spots from from the air and picked out like okay here if we swing around over here we'll have a place better protected from the current we won't be blocking the channel and it'll be great views in private um, so yeah, that was that, that was kind of really fun. Really well, and I, I I suppose you could use that in boondocking yeah. as well to scope out scope out areas spots. in advance by air. Um, so that's really cool, cool way to use technology to, <laughs> to scope things out. Uh, now, so those are just kind of the similarities, and they all have differences, of course. Now we're going to shift into the things that are more different than yeah, a light. Very different. Um, and number one is the number of options and the types of options for boondocking versus anchoring is definitely regional. I mean, you're not going to find many anchoring spots in the middle of Montana. Or Colorado, or Nebraska, and it's you know there's there's a lot of places it's hard to anchor. But when you're out on the coastal waters, there is amazing amounts of well experienced anchorages, or there's what's called gunk holing, where you're just kind of like finding little dead end creeks and finding your own uncharted places. And these become kind of secrets past mm -hmm. word of mouth from a uh, boater to boater of like here's an amazing spot, get here and mm -hmm. don't um, tell anybody. Yeah, <laughs> um, so there's so it's. You know, in Florida, in boondocking in an RV in Florida, it can be done, but you're kind of stuck in the middle of the state in a few places. On by boat between here and uh, Marco Island, we probably went past a hundred different anchorages. Marked, Marked known, known anchorages, and there are many that we could have probably yeah. scoped out ourselves if we were yeah. more adventurous. We were in the Ten Thousand Islands area, probably ten thousand different potential anchorages. Yes, we had endless options uh, when we were 
There's someone looking in our window off our pier. <laughs> um, so it was pretty. Think just smoking a cigarette okay. walking the dock. Okay. Yeah, nothing like smoking a cigarette on the fuel dock. Yeah, smart. Yeah, smart. <laughs> um, yeah, so the options are different. So anchoring out, especially along the East Coast, is a lot more prevalent than boondocking along the East Coast. So we're really looking forward to that change um, and being able to explore more places without having to pay big marina dollars. Um, major difference between the two is the access to walking. <laughs> Um, when you boondock, you pull yeah. in, oh. you're on land, you open your door, and you walk. You're, you're usually out in like, you know, some of our favorite places are some remote desert land where you can walk for 20 miles and just go and go and go. And that's one of our favorite things when we go out in the boondock in the desert is just daily hikes. And or, or mark trails, yeah. or, or mm -hmm. usually around boondocking spots. And well, when you're anchored out, um, even if there, sometimes there's no place to go ashore anywhere nearby. And even if there is, it might be a, a long dinghy ride, or even if it's a short dinghy ride, it's still, you have to go through all the effort of getting your dinghy out, putting it in the water, um, rowing to shore, powering to shore, tying your dinghy up, and then you get to a beach that's only 100 yards long, and you can pace back and forth a few times until the mosquitoes chase you off. So sometimes anchoring out really, really sucks for that. Get out and walk uh, and exercise. Which is one reason that if you're considering doing a lot of anchoring out in a boat, Consider your living space and keep that in mind and what you're going to be comfortable with. Uh, I was really, really happy that we decided to go with a slightly larger boat than we were originally looking for because it gave us more space to spread out and hang out because this was our island. Yeah. It was everything when we were, and we would occasionally find some place that we could beach ashore with the dinghy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we did have some great walks and dinghy experiences, but for the most part, our dinghy explorations were in the water. And then, well, of course, one advantage difference is instead of walking, you can swim, assuming there's no current, there's no, um, alligators. no alligators, amoebas, amoebas <laughs> um, jellyfish. So there's, there's quite a few conditions where you can't swim or you really don't want to swim. But when you can swim, we had some it's amazing, amazing swimming. time swimming off the back of the boat, which we, don't, we rarely get when we're out <laughs> desert boondocking. <laughs> We found some lakes. Sometimes. We have found, yeah, some we have actually had a few. Some, some boondocking spots with lakes. Okay. All right, and then the major difference. Okay, <laughs> when you're in an RV and you go boondocking, you turn off the engine. You maybe put down the jacks, brakes, whatever you do, and you pretty much can <laughs> can assume that your RV is going to stay there. Unless there's a hurricane, landslide, or tornado, earthquake, you know, something really catastrophic. catastrophic Things aren't going to shift around on you overnight. In a boat, there's no parking brake. There's an anchor, but at the very best, you're swinging around With constantly. The wind. So the anchor you put down into the water, <laughs> most of the anchorages that we were were somewhere between six and 10 feet of depth. And then you um, put extra length on your chain to your anchor to create an angle that keeps yeah, you the, more sets the scope just, there, just, so you've got a good it. grip. But think about it, if you've got the current or the tide is changing and a couple times, every basically every six hours, the direction that you're facing changes and your anchor gets pulled up and if it doesn't re-catch in the ground facing the other direction, it might start dragging and skipping along the bottom. Um, that doesn't happen in an RV when you're boot talking. <laughs> so, and then there's also um, wind um, can push your, your boat around, um, waves can make yeah. you move back and forth uh, you know it's cool that your your view is always changing. i like the view changing it's so really you know it's dynamic, like oh yeah. that i see that mangrove now now i see this mangrove right. over here but, it, but it, all that much. it does it does make things a bit more exciting and you have to be a lot more alert so you set a thing called an anchor alarm that will basically a gps alarm that goes off if you start to move outside of your defined circle and it seems like it will always go off at four in the morning or three in the morning and you're you know pitch black, you're naked, and you're trying to figure out what's going on, which direction am I moving, is the anchor reset, is, is it set good, do we have to turn on the engines, and it kind of wakes you up and gives you that little stress. Still for us, and yeah. we, we've talked with more experienced boaters, and they, and they say, get used to it. They say, you just get used to it, and it's less jarring, but there are definitely nights that make it different. As we said, we are newbies, we're still learning mm -hmm. how when to trust our anchor, when to not trust our anchor, how the different ways our boat moves and stuff, so, so we are on extra on guard. Um, and we had pretty good experiences. We only had really one anchor drag in our week out of anchoring, and it was... It, it was in a no, a place that the an active captain actually... Warned us of it. Warned us of it, and um, so we knew to be on alert for it. And 
that was one concern is we went two nights in a row in anchorages that were not as protected as we would have liked and we had two crappy nights of sleep in a row. <laughs> yes, <'cause laughs> so. you're, you're on edge. Yeah, that, that night it was because of the anchor dragging risk. The the night before it was we had some really big storms go near us and it caused then, a lot of and unsettled then, seas. And so then you're going like this, like this. You know that doesn't really happen very often when you're RV boondocking. Even even in a strong storm, it's not nearly as dynamic. Um, so again, we weren't really in any danger. It was, but it does keep you on alert. You did stay up and sit it out, wait it out, make sure that everything calms down. It's and really you have hard to, be ready to sleep to when act. your boat's moving like yes. this for thirty minutes. All yes. right. So those are our the things that we've noticed so far in our short six months of boat ownership. And seven straight days of anchoring. anchoring. Uh, the differences between anchoring and RV boondocking. Um, go ahead. If you have questions, I will now start looking at the live chat, <laughs> and I will try to answer those, and we'll answer those for the evening. Okay. Um, you want to talk about Patreon first? Uh, do you want to get wine or Patreon? I don't care. Okay. okay. Well. Uh, so we're... There, this, there's, we've been on the... On, we, there's a site called Patreon. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, and a lot of vloggers and YouTubers are using it. It's where you, as a subscriber, can voluntarily contribute towards their content creation. And we have we have been supporting uh, Patreons for the last yeah. long time. We love we, it. We like a lot, and, and some of the, some people that is kind of their job, where they're going, they put their effort into creating amazing, awesome videos, and they make a lot of money for doing that. Um, and it allows them to concentrate on it. On, that, become, that, that becomes yeah. their full-time work. We nope. don't want to do that. We don't want to have work. And yes. we've had we, a we've lot got, of people... We've got our day jobs. That's our work. We have, we've been asked several times of people if we would start a Patreon because they wanted to support this content creation. And we've been resistant to it because, number one, we don't need the income. Our full-time jobs of running mobileinternetinfo.com and our premium membership there and our mobile yeah, we, apps... We want, we want that to feel like our work. That and, is our work. And, and this is our fun it. sharing. But what we do crave is more of a closed community. And we've been trying to figure out exactly what to do to get that. Because, you know, we have these chats, but we're, we're not able to really interact with you more and, than this hour. And we don't get to know people really... By Coastal RV. I mean, I'm yeah. sure Coastal RV is awesome <laughs> because they're suggesting we get one. So they obviously know us, but we don't know much about you. Right. And we're not... We're not and uh, Facebook, honestly, lately, our Facebook page... Every time we post something, they're nagging us to pay money to promote our posts yeah, to our it, followers. Like Facebook kind of does this kind of blackmail thing of saying, hey, that's a really great post you just made. If you give us $10, more of your followers will actually see it and interact with you. And, and that's, like, I'm sorry. We're, no, we're that's not what Facebook, that's not how I'm we not use Facebook. I'm paying <laughs> to get our, con we're already putting our time and energy, bandwidth and equipment to create this content for you. We're not going to be paying Facebook to, to share, to, 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 to share tell you it. about it. Uh, we thought about creating a Facebook group to be more of a, an opt-in sort of thing. We can share, because we want, we really want a, a space where we can share a little more behind the scenes where it's not necessarily out in the public. It's people who know us, know our, our personalities a little more, know when we're telling a joke, um, right. and aren't going to be criticizing us when we make a mistake, or are going to be sympathizing, <laughs> laughing with us, right? but not coming so, out so, critical. So yeah, we want we want a, a place that's more comfortable. We, we're, so, so first off, we're not going to stop doing the stuff we do on YouTube now but we're thinking like hey we kind of fun to experiment with having kind of more of a private group and well okay it's it kind of hard to set up but patrons already set up to do that but we don't want it to be a people pay us kind of thing so so there's unfortunately no way to create a free I want, patron <laughs> we want less time on facebook and that was the deciding factor right. we know not everyone's on facebook so we have opened up a patreon page we have set it at you can join for one dollar a month. This is the minimum that they'll the let us set it. Yep. And most of that money goes to them, not to us. Yeah, um, yeah. we get like ninety cents. I guess. No, I think we get seven. Oh yeah, because yeah, the credit card fees. So yeah, so it's yeah. not most, but it's still. They, oh. It's it. We, we want it to be a small. It's just kind of a little barrier to entry. That means people have a little skin in the game, so that we can have a more closed community to interact yeah. and do fun live double bottle wine fun chat. Yeah, type do, stuff. do more of the happy hours, more of the yes. behind the scenes bloopers. Um, yeah. More, more, and we, we don't know what we're going to grow it into. We're not really, we're not growing it for money. That's what I want to be very clear yeah, there's about. There's not seven tiers of like, you know, pay extra and you can be a VIP patron and pay extra again and you can be invited to, um, you know, our birthday party or something. No, this is just a kind of an experiment we're going to do with let's have a little bit of a background community. So that's kind of a little bit of an announcement we're just making here today. So 
if you would like to to be part of that, um, we welcome you to go join. It's patreon.com slash technomadia. P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Yeah. Um, and we welcome you to come and join us there. Um, our live video chats in the future will still continue to be public, um, but the announcements of them will be only going through the Patreon right. because right now we're paying for an email list to send <laughs> announcements, announcements about our videos to people who yeah so, so so we're going to try to transitions that you know the, kind of the insiders friends of technomadia and stuff will hopefully want to be our patrons and and you know we will have kind of like more of that inside communication then we might do some patron only video stuff um all right so i'll get the wine and you can start scrolling okay, I'm, gonna go, I'm gonna pop this chat screen out and look at some of these questions that you guys have been asking Oh, yellowtail. Let's see. Go ahead and, and if you got questions, go ahead and, and uh, get them going. And if you're going to join us for a beverage, go ahead and do that. Yes. Um, so first question there is, what is your fuel economy and speed? And I think economy is probably the <laughs> wrong word. But we did just have our very first fill up. And if you saw the video, we just, uh, or no, first, it's our second one. But it's the first one first where one we, with our miles. Um, let's see, I can actually bring up those numbers. I actually put them in the blog post version. So I'll bring it up. Just a moment. So we generally are cruising somewhere between six and eight knots, and we do occasionally, every, every three hours, we've been told by our mechanics and our training captains. Um, Let's get a little extra speed in. To, to get up on plane for about five minutes, about every three engine hours. So we do that, which gets us up to about, about 16, 17 knots. We can get up more. to 19 if we really floor it, but that's and, just and throwing we, and, fuel out the back. And the barnacles are cleaned off the hull, yes. we've learned. Cheers. Uh, cheers to you. Cheers to everybody. All right, let me see. I put the numbers here. We got the stats, yeah. The stats. So we, uh, our tanks, we can hold 440 gallons of diesel. Um, and this last time we filled about 210 gallons into it. We had gone 250 nautical miles since we, our last fill. So more than a mile a gallon. Well, except for we had 55 generator hours so running there. Way more than a mile a gallon. So we don't know what the fuel consumption is on the generator. Uh, best that we can tell, our generator uses somewhere probably between 0.8 and <laughs> 1 gallon per hour. So let's just say 1 gallon per hour. We are figuring that our fuel economy is about 1.6 nautical miles per gallon. But more importantly, we've been told, is that it's, it's the uh, fuel consumption per engine hour. And it seems it's uh, 3.56 gallons per hour to run both of our engines. And we've got Cummins 370s. I hope that answers that question. Yeah. Um, let's see, how is, uh, let's see, da, 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 da. have you guys considered wind power to go along with the solar on the boat? Um, we slightly thought about it. I think we're going to be able to get more than enough power with solar and we are big silence fans and there are some really good quiet wind power generators, but there are some really loud ones and even the quiet ones aren't totally quiet. So probably not going to do wind power. And also because a lot of the places we're going to be boating doing the Great Loop are much more sheltered than if we were out in the Caribbean and stuff where wind power makes more sense, where there's always a breeze. Um, I think, is this, okay, it seems like this Randy West person is a troll, so I will just remove you. <laughs> um, yes, kind of, yes, yeah, be, because we have... Yeah, we're we're not this is interested. Why in, we want to do Patreon? We we, we want to have have the people in our community who are inter, that we're interacting in the Q and A's uh -huh. and stuff be positive. You know, we, we yeah. we're not interested. We're not on YouTube to deal with people who are being critical of us and our lifestyle. If you if you are, you know, there's a channel change for mm -hmm. that. You there's no reason to interact with people if you don't like them. So move on. Don't say anything. And mm -hmm. <laughs> so yes. All right. Um. <laughs> Cynthia says, boating seems much more complicated than RVing. I will just stick to my plan to get an RV. And definitely, RVing is definitely less complicated. It's just after 11 <laughs> years, yes. it stopped being challenging. And we like new adventures, right. and we like new challenges and new learning experiences. It's, it's interesting because a lot of boaters go to RVing after, you know, that that's where they move to next when they're looking for something simpler. simpler. We're, we're kind of doing it backwards because um, we're looking for something more complicated. And we're loving. We're loving having new things to learn. It's been very exciting. Exciting. And we 
still will be RVing. We have kept our bus, and oh, we will be moving back bus. into the RV in the winters as we move up the loop. Yeah, we're actually already made announced we're going to be doing the RV Entrepreneur Summit in Texas, um, and so we're going to be planning a big RV trip across country to Texas in February, and very excited about that, actually. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, did we answer the one about solar? I mean, wind, wind power? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so Matthew would like to know, is the fuel consumption uh, what we first thought we were going to get started, and are things better or worse than you are hoping? It's actually right in line with what we That's were... actually interesting. Slightly better. Slightly better yeah. so far. Um, but the important thing when you're talking about fuel costs, especially as a full-timer, and so remember, we don't own a house. This is not an extra expense for us. Uh, we have always considered fuel costs, whether it's in the RV or the boat, to be part of our rent. Mm -hmm. And um, so rent plus marina and or campground fees every month is what makes up our, what replaces what our old mortgage or rent was. And yeah. we have complete control over that by controlling our pace. And we anticipate that our boating will be similar to our RV fuel costs just because we're going to be taking such a slower pace. Um, and so far that is playing out to be true. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's so. really not been extra expensive to be a mm -hmm. boat livers. Um, let's see, I saw somebody ask, what should we be looking at off to the right? That's the chat screen, so that's where oh, we yes. can see the comments. Yeah, my, co my computer is right over here, so yes. I can't, uh, that's where the questions yes. are. <laughs> okay. How many watts of solar are you planning for the boat? Uh, we did some sizing just yesterday, and we're hoping to get 1,440 watts. Looks like it. Yeah, yeah. they did a lot of design work in the last 24 hours, so... Stay tuned. Let's Hopefully see, it comes working, together. We're, we're working on that right now. Um, how will your planned solar system be different from your bus? Um, it'll be on top of our bimini <laughs> instead of our roof. Um, and it's, yeah, we got like more roof space to work with here because the bus is, is narrow and have a lot of things up there. Here we don't have a hard roof. We have a, a bimini, but it's got a, a hard frame. So it's, it's going to let us use a different size of panels. You know, we had to use very narrow panels for the bus. We could use bigger panels for the boat. That's kind of what I'm looking at right now. Um, same basic okay. concepts, though. Um, have you tried box wine for the boat? We find it makes a great way to store and use, and that's absolutely true. We use box wine on the RV. It's great. And the things that we like best of box wine, it's, it's going to be pretty good ones, is number one, the box is uh, compostable. And when you're boondocking, you can burn it in your campfire. I wouldn't suggest burning it. No campfires on the boat. On the boat. Yes. No, no, no. On Beach the boat. fires, maybe. But when you get it done, you can uh, blow it up like a pillow. And it's, it's a, a travel it's a, pillow. It's actually Coast Guard certified as an emergency not, inflation device. It's not Coast Guard certified. Do not spread it false. It should be Coast Guard certified because, <laughs> I mean, you drink the wine, you don't mind being floating in the icy cold waters, and you got a, your little floaties there. It's perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay, so no job. Um, you seem to also be a troll, so goodbye. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. We do have jobs. We work our butts off, so yay. Yes. Um, what will instigate your move back to the bus, weather or location? Uh, it'll probably be weather. So as we're moving up the loop, it will get cold and become uncomfortable or unable to, uh, to yeah. boat. Yes. The boating season in Canada is very short, and we, we were hoping to spread our time of like boating through Canada over several and, and years. New and, York and yeah. things like mm -hmm. that. So as it gets too cold to com boat comfortably, we'll move back into the bus. And we definitely want to keep RVing. We do love RVing, and uh, we do definitely want to have that experience yes. as well. But it'll be much more expensive to store the boat so yes. mm -hmm. than it is the yeah, RV. We'll be, we'll be figuring all that out as we go. We, we, we don't have all the answers, but we like figuring out things as we go along. Mm -hmm. I like J-Man. Thank you. Who cares about how much fuel burn? I don't <laughs> owe anyone an explanation. And uh, we definitely appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, are you able to monitor your RV and vice versa when in the RV? Are you able to monitor the boat on oh. conditions? So uh, we can remote into our inverter and check the status of the battery. Yep. And uh, we are experimenting with some remote cameras. Yeah, so so we can see what's, what's up in the bus. We can see exactly how much power the bus is generating right now. It basically only needs to power its exhaust fan. Um, but I've got, I'm missing all that electrical remote control ability that we have on the bus, and hopefully we'll have it on the boat soon. Um, how are you planning on storing power from the panels? And this goes into other questions that I'm seeing about, will we also do, be doing lithium on the boat? Love lithium, and um, yes, been researching that. There's actually some uh, 
new technology that I've got my eye on that might be even more um, energy dense and more capacity and less weight than the lithium we did on the bus six years ago. So things have evolved. So again, just early stages of research, but it could happen fast once we decide exactly what our plans are. So looking forward to having energy, a good energy system on the boat. Yes, getting back to energy independence and less generator. But I was impressed with how well the generator worked while we were anchored out, because we are in southwest, southwest Florida, we are in the Everglades in summer. With a cat. Uh, who and a redhead. To, yes, <laughs> yes, between the two of them, the cat panting and Cherie pacing is like, okay, time to turn the air conditioner on, and they both start nodding their heads. I'm like, okay, turn on the generator, turn on the air conditioner. Yes. But the generator was so much more quiet. We don't, we, in the bus, actually, we, when we ran the generator, we, we, it was just unpleasant. We'd sometimes just run the generator and go for a walk and let it cool down while we're out or away, and it's it's not something we really enjoyed having the generator on. In the boat, it's a lot more tolerable to let the generator run for hours on end. Yes. Um, Nigel is from the UK, and they're planning to do the loop in the winter of 2018. Have you seen any UK flag boats on the ICW? We have not actually hit the ICW yet, officially. Actually, actually technically we have. Well, not much of it. Yeah. <laughs> We're down to the Keys. We just so came we just from, now from intersected Myers, the ICW. And we are very off-season for the loop. We have actually only seen maybe three loopers in total in the last six months because most of the loopers are up in, uh, you know, if they're following the seasons, they're on a very different part of the loop right now for the summer. Right. So a lot of them were following stories up in the Great Lakes and them yes. encountering, like, sea conditions up there. Yes. So, um, so yeah. we've been very isolated down here. There's not many boat boaters and cruisers, and it, definitely not many loopers. It, it is really interesting to be in the Keys in the off season. It's it is it is hot and uncomfortable, but it is. We keep hearing all these horror stories about how crowded it is, and you know, wait in line for restaurants, and waterways are a zoo, and it's it's actually you know deserted. The marinas are are wide open. There's lots of anchoring space, lots of mooring space, um, and it's not crowded at all. So we, we kind of actually like the the vibe right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, will we be doing the Trent Severn Waterway? Absolutely. That's on my bucket list of, of, of waterways and locks. Yes. I keep a list of yes. locks I want to go yes, through. Yes, he does. <laughs> uh, Scott suggests that we drink more boxes of wine to create a dinghy. That's a great idea. That's an inflatable dinghy, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Double Fun Charters asks, is how has internet connectivity been while anchoring? And that was actually very interesting down the Everglades. So we actually got an in-reach satellite tracker and communicator so we can do text messaging and still get weather forecasts and still send emergency messages and stuff anywhere on Earth. Because we thought, going through the Everglades, we are in the middle of nowhere. But we still, with our antennas and gear, we managed to get online every single spot we went to, which was kind of caught us by surprise. Um, it wasn't necessarily the greatest connections, but even like in Shark River, which is supposed to be no, no signal, signal whatsoever, we got online with a directional antenna. For a little bit. Yes. Only because, a little bit. Because every time, the directional antennas are really hard on a boat, because every time the boat swings around with the current, oh, suddenly the direction you uh, point And we, did, is we did try some of our omnidirectional high gain antennas, and we have nothing permanently installed on the boat yet. It's all very temporary mounts that we're testing with our RV gear, and we're working on getting some marine specific antennas in uh, to install as well so um, but uh, when anchored out just you know just like in boondocking is when you're anchored out you're usually in places that are fairly close to civilization and cell towers so getting connectivity is very similar to RV boondocking um, it's just there are a few remote locations yeah. like the Everglades where if we hadn't had AT&T there's no way we would have yeah. been online right having the diversity of carriers just just like in RVing but even more so I guess here we, we went through the, the Having being able to try every connection, other than usually it's not even worth bothering with Sprint, but Verizon, T Mobile, and ATT all seem to have places that they're the only option that we've run across. Um, Bob would like to know are we going to make it to the RTR? So, for those of you RVers, the RTR is the Rubber Tramp Rendezvous, and it's a big meetup in Quartzsite, uh, Arizona, in January. Um, and we have shown up a couple times when we're out that way and done presentations great, and hung great out. Great group of people. Great, awesome. A lot of the van dwellers and a, just a collected group of people. Yeah, there, there is a yacht club in Quartzsite, but it is um, <laughs> kind of landlocked. So yes. yes. <laughs> um, when we do Quartzsite, we usually camp with the escapers group because uh, we helped found that group with the Escapees RV Club, and then we do side trips over to RTR to visit. Um, this year, we probably are not going to make it out to Quartzsite. Uh, the current plan is we're still going to have the boat in Florida through the end of this year. 
Um, my Which mother's means, is probably going in for some major surgery, so we're going to be sticking around to help her out with that towards the end of the year. And yeah, so and then we'll be in prime boating season in Florida. So we'll take a, a break for our RV trip to Texas. Probably in about the two months. Yeah. We'll probably leave because the RV Entrepreneur Summit in Fredericksburg, Texas is end of February. Right. Um, so we'll probably leave sometime in early February from Florida, assuming my mother's you know, doing well. And then stay in Texas for a little bit of springtime, because Texas in springtime amazing, is amazing. Springtime. And then we'll find some place in Texas or that area to store the bus. Um, and then next season... We'll get we, all the way out west. We'll get, we'll get the bus all the way out to the southwest. And hopefully um, winter of 2019, we'll actually do extended RVing in the southwest again. And all then, the boats and storage. Yes. yes but it's kind of the, the general plan. Yes. yes. Um, we do miss the desert. We do. We definitely do. In uh, the lack of bugs. Mm -hmm. um, bugs. Oh, oh my gosh. bugs. Uh, Julie Everybody would like to know, bugs. what is the average to store your boat? And that seems to vary very widely. We really haven't had to research that yet. I mean, we... So, so there's wet storage, so that's keeping it in a marina. And monthly rates we're seeing going anywhere from $8 to $50 per foot. Um, obviously, if we were doing long-term storage, we'd be looking on the lower end of that. Yes. Um, it will pay the higher end if we want to be somewhere really cool downtown. Um, and then uh, you don't pay a liveaboard fee when you're storing it there. And then there's also dry storage, and that's having the boat actually physically lifted out of the water. Um, you winterize it just like you would winterize an RV, plus more. Um, and then store it on yeah, land. Sometimes they actually even wrap it, wrap it in kind of yeah. big shrink wrap, looks like a giant marshmallow, and store it so that way it's protected from the elements. Yeah. And I honestly don't know what the average cost is. I, I'm in my mind, I'm thinking marina fees and anticipating it'll cost us five or six hundred dollars a month at minimum. Yeah. So it's something that we're going to be prioritizing the um, boat travels just so we, you know, if we're spending that much, I'd rather be on the boat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, so we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So somebody says, "Do you keep in touch with the winds?" Um, <laughs> we yes, we, we we do quite a bit. Um, they're they're what good friends of ours. Ah, uh, yeah, we do keep in touch with the winds. And um, the, their last live video for their patrons, they actually were saw that we were watching, and they were like, "Oh my God, hey, Techno Maddie, we love you guys." And, yeah, and we communicate behind the scenes yeah, as well. So, <laughs> so it's, it's so yeah. It, we, before either of us were on the water, we were talking about mm -hmm. boats together the first time we met. Mm -hmm. So yes. <laughs> But they're catamaraners. We're okay. Uh, no Lurie advertising Otters. on my channel. Somebody's advertising. Yes. yes. Um, okay. Whose hair takes longer, longer to, to wash. wash? So, actually, I'm going on ten years without using shampoo. How about you? Roughly the same, basically. Yeah. yeah. So we quit using shampoo a long time ago. It's great for water saving, and it's great for your hair's um, condition. Yeah, you, you go through like a one month transition, and then your hair just gets great. It's it's. Yeah, the oils, a little bit of conditioner, oil, uh, hard, every, so some, every so often a little bit of baking soda, and um, yeah. So we both can just rinse our hair with a little bit of water every so often, and it, it reacts pretty darn well. <laughs> yes. So I think it's about similar. I yeah, just quick yeah. rinses. Uh, Sheree takes more frequent showers and short, shorter. and I take less frequent but long. So you know, mm -hmm. so it's mostly because my skin reacts certain ways. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Okay, Edward uh, would like to know, if we could only do one, the boat or the bus, which would you do and why? And uh, number one, I'm glad I don't have to make that choice. Yeah, no, because... I don't, I, I sincerely you know, love both. Yeah, I, I seriously, like, you know, if, if I had been on the boat for 10 years and I just started in the RV and you made me pick one, I'd say I want the RV. And if I'd been on, since we've been on the RV for 10 years and we're just new in the boat and you, if you forced me to pick one, I'd say I, I want the boat because it's, it's the, the new, new experience. experience. But, but, I'm but not I love ready them to, both. Yeah. I am not ready to yeah. give up RVing. Nowhere close to that. Uh, when we did our little trip in May, we did a week going through some Florida state parks uh, in the RV. I, I just loved it. I loved being, I loved the aspects of being able to walk outside and having a yard, a new yard around us all the mm -hmm. time. It's a very different experience yeah. and now, one that I love as well. Now, now you, you like driving the boat. Oh, you don't like driving the that RV. That is different. I hate driving motorized vehicles and fast paces. I love driving the boat. Right. Yeah. I, I, Sheree, Sheree is like, she just latches on. She's like, she wants to drive. She's like, doesn't want the autopilot. She's like, give me the wheel. I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, and the autopilot's actually something I love about the boat is it lets you relax. Because I love driving the bus, but it is 110% concentration, particularly when you're in traffic. Driving the boat is 
It's two hundred percent concentration while you're docking. It's 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 and in traffic. And in tra it, traffic's not so bad, but we haven't been in traffic. Yeah, we haven't been in heavy traffic, but but in general, just cruising the boat is so relaxing because you're moving at seven knots. You've got plenty of time. As we when we crossed the Florida Bay, I was learning how to use the autopilot to dodge the crab pots and not even have to take the autopilot off. I'm just like, okay, dodge, 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 dodge. Okay. And then you go read a few emails. Oh, oh, another crab pot coming up. You caught your course. Do, 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 do. You know, you basically, you're steering with like two, your thumb. And I love that. Whereas when I drive the bus, I love driving the bus. But at the end of the day, I'm exhausted. It's, you know, even if it's just a 200 mile day, it's it's draining. Whereas in the boat, I'm energized at the end of a, a boat trip. Yeah. And yeah, we did a 40 mile 40 repositioning, miles. mostly <laughs> offshore. It was so calm and beautiful. Yeah, I went down, I vacuumed. I, um, <laughs> yeah, well, he was taking watch. We, we had lunch together up on the flybridge with one of us keeping, you know, yeah. a constant scan, but we're able to sit down and enjoy a lunch together while the boat is driving itself. Yes. Which seems like that sh is wrong. And I'm but looking forward to, to the Tesla RV and, you know, Elon <laughs> Musk. I'm ready for an RV that can do the same thing because, you know, I just want to press a button and be able to go back and chill. Um, but the boat's a lot closer to that. Crab pots kind of ruin the fun a little bit, you know, because in, once we got into the crabbing areas, it was really annoying. You can't step away for more than a minute, but, you know, it's still really much more relaxing than driving above a bus. Um, what have you found to be a surprise or pain in maintenance for the boat? I have my answer. Do you? I was not prepared for bottom cleanings. In all my research... You clean your bottom all the time. You take frequent showers. We talked about that. Not that bottom. <laughs> <laughs> in all our research on the boats... We got our boat, we got it into marina, and we saw these divers, scuba divers, constantly coming into the marina, going underneath the boat and chiseling things off. And we looked at each other and was like, do we have to do that to our boat too? And we yeah. asked the priority, oh so yeah, once a month you need to have a diver come and scrape barnacles off the bottom of the boat. And I'm like, once a month? Oh, wow. Well, okay. So that to me, that was a surprise. Um, see, a bit of a surprise for me is, was just realizing how inaccessible so many things on a boat are to work on it's you know some of these things would be like oh that that's that's really simple it's just like three hoses seven screws blah 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 i could fix that but then you realize that you have to do it blind one-handed you know you could look in and you have to plot out where something is and you got to get in here and you're doing stuff with one hand you can't reach with two hands it's just physically impossible and oh you drop something oh double triple crap you're like you know now making little hooks to try and fish your tools up you dropped and so working on things in the belly of a boat can be really challenging and i'm a little bit surprised at how challenging that has been actually you know it's fun to learn but it's uh, definitely new skills new bloody knuckles okay um sorry i lost my place here Somebody, um, have you? So John is asking, have you changed out any of the electronics, and are you using Navionics? And Na they like our videos. Thank you. Na Navionics, love. I'm so impressed with the Navionics app. We're using that on several iPads. Yeah. So so right now our marine electronics, we have a old Garmin chart plotter. We have a, a depth sounder that we can squint, and if we angle our eyes just right, we can see. So that's actually our biggest hole right now. Is it's very we we don't have good bottom awareness. Um, and you know we have to be very very obsessively squinting at that thing and so um, we're eagerly looking at marine electronics we actually spent a couple hours at west marine the other day playing with user interfaces of the ray marine axiom and the simrad uh evos uh the evo 3 is kind of impressing us right now i really want to check out the fruno a little bit more um so yeah we're zeroing in on some marine electronics upgrades but right now our main marine electronics is we have one ipad running navionics one ipad running garmin um, it's amazing that you, you know, uh, these, you, the software quality on the iPads for marine navigation is amazing. And it's great. You can have the two major competitors right there side by side and use both their best features, which is awesome. All right. Um, how will we heat the boat in cold weather? We actually have seven heaters on board. <laughs> yes. The, the um, Bayliners are made for the Pacific Northwest is kind of their home turf the up area up near Seattle and Puget Sound and stuff. So they have probably more effort put into heating them than, than not. Um, we don't have a diesel heater, which I guess a lot of people upgrade to who are in seriously cold weather. But if it's seriously cold, then we're putting the boat in storage and going back That's to That's our RV. decision to, to store. And, and but we have seven electric heaters on board built in. It's yeah. uh, Chris, do you uh, uh, break through by Goodfellow and sodium-based batteries? 
I don't know. It seems like a comment on something before. Oh no, yeah. On the no, there's um some um uh, some new lithium chemistries that's uh using manganese that are now commercially available. Let's just find out about them. And um yeah, Victron's got some new battery cells that I'm intrigued by and uh, could be really great for capacity. All right. There's several questions. I'm going to try to answer them all at once about <laughs> weather and what would we do if bad weather is forecasted. What about hurricanes and lightning? So uh, we did we did a specific video on this dedicated to it and. Um, I've lived in, I lived in Florida for 12 years on the beach, mid-coast uh, Melbourne area for 12 years before I hit the road. You lived in Miami, uh, your parents went through Andrew, we're of course all watching what's happening in the Texas coast and in Houston, we're yes. all very aware oh of the real impacts that hurricanes have had. There is no joking about these guys and this is a very active season. Right. And that was a decision in making the decision to uh, boat and start boating this season. You know, we could have just hightailed it out of here, skipped this part of the loop, and come back to it later. We decided that was not smart, being boating newbies. There's more risk to that, rushing it, than taking the chance with a hurricane. So step number one, we have insurance that covers the boat. Step number two, uh, we have our bus that is parked in Central Florida that we can get to and get it out of the area as our other home. We have two homes. We also, step three, we have two uh parents who have fixed stationary homes on opposite coast in Florida that we could use as temporary housing if we if both right. of our mobile homes were left. So, so and, being realistic. And also we have a, a boat that, that can go relatively fast if we need to hightail it this way or that way to get out of harm's way, yeah. there's a possibility if you've got enough notice. So 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 we have a lot of backup plans, but the big thing is we just have hyper awareness. So right now in hurricane season at least three times a day. We maybe sometimes skip the 2 a.m. update. But Not the, always. I usually wake up at 2 a.m. Yeah. and check it. So, so yeah, the, every six hours, the National Hurricane Center puts out their, their updates, and we check them religiously, mm -hmm. and um, we check the models, and we just keep a, keep a, a good awareness of our risks. And, and, then we, and you know, when we get to a new location, especially if we're going long-term, uh, like when we were in Fort Myers, that marina withstood uh, Hurricane Charlie. Yeah, it was a very protected outer, space. Uh, very protected, and they had a really solid hurricane plan. So we felt safe there if something happened. In fact, the boat did ride out uh, Tropical Storm Emily there uh, back in, was that early August? Yeah, your mom got to ride it out. Just a Tropical yeah. Storm. It wasn't that big of a deal. Um, mm -hmm. But we're keeping hyper aware. We're researching what the options are locally. What are you know what are the risks in a marina if we want to tie up? Where are the hurricane holes if we want to go anchor out? More than likely, I don't want to ride out a hurricane on the boat. That no. just doesn't seem fun. Um, but it's just being realistic. Boats can be replaced. Cats cannot. Yes. Um, we cannot. Our data cannot. Um, we're flexible. We're going to be realistic. We're going to secure <laughs> the boat as best we can. Right. And we're going to make informed decisions, and you can't pre-plan it for not knowing where you're going to be when one would hit, and where you might go. The Mevo, I forgot to plug it in. When oh, we had the it batteries. Outside, so yes, let me get this back plugged in. Uh, so that's our plan. If there is one, there is keeping hyper aware. Um, when we were coming to Key West this time, we were watching all these storms coming across, one of them which did turn into Harvey, and one that is a Invest 92, which is now going to be upgraded to a tropical storm. I think the other alert was my wine glass was quickly low. Um, we were watching those come across, and we knew that um, there was a high probability of Invest 92 coming to the Keys. Uh, or southern Florida. So we planned, we, we actually pushed our trip. We were planning two weeks out in the Everglades. We pushed it up to only one week. Right. So just to make we sure were, we had a safe place. And sure enough, Invest 92 just hovered over the Everglades for about a week, for the last week, and we missed most of it because <laughs> we were watching and right. making as best informed decisions as right. we can, and we hope that continues now. Are we meteorologists? No, but, you know, you can only do the best yeah. you can. Right. Um, so, so why did we go through Key West instead of through the locks? Because um, we can. Yeah, be, 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 because once we had the dinghy on board, um, and somebody also asked, us, yeah. how's the dinghy yeah, thing we'll going? The dinghy, dinghy, dinghy caddy is going great. But if, once we had a dinghy on board, then suddenly the keys make a lot of sense. It's, it's the more exciting, interesting, challenging route. So, sure, let's do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the main thing. Yeah, and it'll be many years before we're back down this way, and the key sounded more fun than the lock. We did go through the lock. Yeah, we, we went through one of them. We did We did the first lock there, closest to Fort Myer, just to, to get the experience and learning. Um, and uh, 
we had RV'd that basically the entire uh, Okeechobee waterway right. this past winter, so we figured the Keys was the new experience. Right, and we haven't really been to the Keys. Last time we were in the Keys, we were in Marathon shopping for a eight sailboat. years ago when we were sailboat shopping, and then we yep. decided to postpone getting a sail getting a boat and go live in the Virgin Islands. Uh -huh. All right. Uh, so the next question, which ties into that, is Mike asks, is how is the dinghy mount working out? And we will have a video on the dinghy and dinghy mount soon. Yeah. Uh, we went with the dinghy caddy. Uh, I'm super impressed. Yes, it's working out really well. Um, I can hoist the boat up myself. That was it. one of the key tests, and one of the things we were worried about is it's it's a manual winch system. It's not electric, and we can both raise and lower it solo, which and is great. And we can deploy it really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, the bay liner originally had a boat deck up on or right above us, yeah. so it would be up on the flight. Had a bridge. crane, and you have to lift the dinghy all the way up to the top. And uh, we had a, a friend of ours this. Unfortunately, if, uh, several months ago, he had a fire on his boat, and he could not get the dinghy deployed as a life raft. And um, so that made us happy that we didn't have that set up with this particular yeah. boat, and so we're hoping that this gives us a lot and more uh, it safety. Is, it, it is, because we did a lot of research in picking out this dinghy system and uh, the dinghy caddy, and it, it's been really nice to have so many people now coming up and saying, oh, I love that system. We've mm -hmm. actually had people go, or, really or, well. or, or, or I'm like, I really want to learn more about that. So we've had a lot of really positive outsider responses to it. And so far for us, it's been working really, really well. Oh, let's see, trying to find the next question. Um, expedition overlanding. Was is there a similar type of boating to looping events around the U.S. and Europe? I think the most, there's the canal systems, right? Oh God, yeah! In in Europe, there is a, um, some amazing canal, met, extensive canal waterways. And there's a whole community of people who do canal boats and do it perpetually. They'll follow the seasons, kind of equivalent of the loop here. Um, and there's also a whole different narrow boat culture in the UK, where the boats need to be smaller because the canals are older. But yeah, there there's and someday down the road, I'd love to to experience all of that. But I've done I've read some really great adventure mm -hmm. and, and stories of boating and canal boating through Europe. And uh, Joe the Computer Guy apparently has already joined Patreon. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you, Joe. Um, and he's uh, relaying that he can follow our Garmin information. Oh, yes, yeah, so that is something we did turn on for yes. the Patreon in there. Yes, yeah, so yeah, so we, we've got the Garmin tracking, so you can see oh. our little dots. Even when we have no cell signal, you can see our dots of where we go, and we're trusting our patrons mm -hmm. to know where we are t up to the moment. All right, so uh, uh, Sutliff would like to know... What does Kikinator think of the new life? And did we bring her ashore or other boats sometimes? And Kiki's sleeping. Um, she seems to be adapting really well to boat she, life. She did not like anchoring out with the it's heat. A, the, with the heat or uh, lack of places to walk. We did take her on the dinghy a couple times without the engine on. We're introducing her to it slowly, so we would just row around the boat with her on it. Um, yeah, she, she's she's been probably more comfortable on the boat than than we are with her being on the boat at times because she'll just like go walk around the little. Oh, she's walking outside on the little she goes narrow looping. ledge. She goes looping around yes. the boat, and I'm like it um, it it, uh, it makes mama. We, a we little have we haven't nervous. done a cat overboard drill yet. We're gonna wait till we have nice, calm, clear, relatively shallow water with no alligators. With no alligators, like we're like in the keys, like no, up in the Everglades. We're like this is not good water to, to test. practice cat cat overboard, but. We will get her familiar mm -hmm. with being immersed in the water mm -hmm. and rescued and mm -hmm. gently, kindly, but yes, we'll practice. All right. Uh, Dan would like to know, is it possible to dock and live aboard in a nice municipal marina in Florida for less than 600 per month over winter? And that's going to be totally dependent upon the yeah. length of your boat. Marinas charge by length of boat. So yes, it is totally possible. But, but how much is the, the mooring balls here? Uh, the was... mooring ball. So we're uh, in Marathon, Florida right now key. in yeah. the, uh, the Keys. And there's a mooring field over here. They have 216 balls. And I think we only charge $324 a month for a mooring ball. And that includes one pump out every week. And you have to provide drone power. It's, yeah. it's basically... And it also includes a parking spot. They'll receive your mail. You have access to a workshop, a dinghy dock, mm -hmm. a bike parking. But if you want to be docked at a marina, you'll, you'll, you'll have to shop around. You'll need to have a shorter boat. And also consider that most marinas... Uh, charge a live aboard fee on top of the dockage fee. Yeah. But like there's a huge community, and oh, and the, the Marathon Mooring Field is live aboards only. So that's a huge community of people, particularly mm -hmm. in the winter. Right now there's a lot of openings, but in the winter apparently it's like a 60 person waiting list because basically from January, February, March, they are packed solid. Um, but dirt cheap way to live in Florida in a great community. Yeah. Yeah. But there are, there are ways to do it if you have a shorter boat. Uh, winter, uh, you're going to be paying in-season rates. 
Um, so like the marina we stayed at in Fort Myers charged $14 per foot off season, but it was $19 per foot in, in season. season. So we, for our 47 foot behemoth of a boat, which is not a behemoth, we have seen much bigger boats. Um, our boat was, we were paying with the liveaboard feed and electric is around 900 a month total to stay in Fort Myers yep. off season. And that was an amazing high class, uh, pretty, pretty well maintained. Yeah, marina. it's very nice marina. The municipal one down was a slightly cheaper, but they charged uh, parking for your car extra there. So, yep. and so. Uh, on how much? Wait a minute. Ah. Uh, this is this is where we wish we had the assistant on hand know, to keep I track of the questions. But yeah, okay, is. we're informal. We're chilling. Yes, we're hanging yes. out. We're in here over an hour now, guys. So you know, we're just chilling and enjoying our wine. Yep. Um, how much do you run the AC when we're on the hook this time of year? And I think we, we were doing ran, six to seven hours a day. We, yeah, we, there were some days we really ran it a lot because it was humid. There wasn't a lot of breeze. When there's a breeze, it it's does an tolerable. amazing job of cooling things off. But when there wasn't a breeze, the cat would just start to pant and look at us and we'd be like, oh, fine. And it was she, very stressful for her. And Sheree would, bl Sheree would use the cat as an excuse. Like, I think the cat the cat's needs, panting. The cat, <laughs> So, yeah, we, but but it wasn't, you know, we just, you know, fire up our computers and get work mm -hmm. done inside. So we actually had a really good time. Mm -hmm. uh, Jonathan wants to know for water conservation, any advice for teaching a female tween about water conservation? I would say take her out in your new RV and make her have to handle the water chores. Make her yeah. have to dump the gray water. Make her have to fill the water tanks. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a great way to do it. Yeah. I know. I was... As a, a teen and a tween, I was very involved in inter environmental groups and things like that. And I was always trying to push my friends and my family to, you know, turn off the water when you're brushing your teeth sort of stuff. But, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I would say put her in charge of the water management on your new yeah. RV there, Jonathan. Um, uh, do you ever get bad sea legs? Bad sea legs. I'm not sure seasick, bad, maybe? Or? Neither has gotten seasick yet. Kiki Pat has, has sick twice. Once, twice. Well, once during the tropical storm, well, docked. Yeah, yeah, that's. And once while we were. And when we had that storm off of Cape Sable, you know, we were yeah. basically, you know, it was almost like just sit on the floor and let the boat rock because it was. Um, well, I, I, I still feel comfortable run, running up and down the stairs, but Cherie's like, sit down, sit down. Sit down. <laughs> oh, it was. It was. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it, was it was. It was scary. It was. It was um, exciting amount mm -hmm. of motion that we experienced there. Mm -hmm. J-Man comments that most people start out with a 28-foot boat and you guys jumped in at 47. That's <laughs> badass. Thank you for that photo confidence. Uh, it has been, so I think we skipped a question. Someone asked if it's been comfortable for us to handle. We don't have, you had a 26-foot boat in college, right? No, it, it, we, had, we had a Sea Ray 270 when I was in high school. It was kind of our weekend home at the Jersey Shore. I took the boat to prom and, you know, I, so I, I, I did a lot of boating back then. But I then, used to sail a 17-foot catamaran, but... Since that, since then, and it, but I guess when I was really little, my grandpa had little runabouts at Lake of the Ozarks. But you know, so but ever since high school, I had not been in charge of a boat bigger than a Hobie Cat or a kayak. Yeah. So we had we've never piloted a boat in between those sizes. So you know, we originally started looking more in the thirty-eight to forty-two foot range because that seemed to be the ideal size target, um, and we ended up with forty-seven. Um, and it's not. I mean, it's all we know. As far as boats, really. It, it, yeah, the, the first couple times docking was, like, mega adrenaline nervous. Like, particularly the first time we came into Legacy Harbor when those other boats were there and we had, to, like, inches to spin. And that was, like, left my knees like jello after doing that docking. Um, but I'm feeling really, you know, knock on fiberglass, but I, I've been feeling really confident yeah. with docking yeah, the, and the, uh, maneuvering and stuff. The marina that we did in Naples was pretty tight, and you nailed it first try. Yeah, it's I, I'm I'm getting used to the boat. Um, that's that's one thing that's been a downside of moving a lot is Cherie and I both trade off driving the boat, and she is an expert boat driver and navigator and everything else. 
but so far we've I all the new places she got proficient docking at our first marina and she learned how to, to dock a maneuver but I've been kind of the designated docker ever since just because I got more practice you got yeah we need to switch it up because right. you don't have practice with lines right exactly and she's the she's gotten all the practice with the looping the lines and getting the boat secure as we come in so yeah it's so we, we a natural thing for ropes she's very good with ropes and so we, <laughs> we, we do need to, to to mix it up a little we bit do. um but yeah I and I've always been comfortable with big vehicles just in general and you took I, right yeah. to the bus yeah, yeah i mean, I, I, bus, I, you know, I mean first time I, first time i ever driven a bus i you know hopped right in it's like i i, I don't i don't mind vehicles and I, i've got a pilot's license and you know i've i've never had intimidation with vehicles so i'm knock on fiberglass <laughs> um let's see uh, expedition overlanding asks what about crab pots and manatees lobster pots down here in the Keys. Oh my gosh, crossing from Cape Sable down here to the Keys. It was a minefield because oh. the lobster season apparently just opened a couple weeks ago. And they put out a million different lobster pots. It was we like only hit one. No, none of the propellers. We actually got to dive underneath the boat with our skis. Just to double check, check. <laughs> uh, snorkeling area because yeah, we did have uh, um, one lobster pot got the best of us in a strong three knot current and sort of the wrong way because the boat just skidded right into it and it was like, oh crap, into neutral. <laughs> And then there's a little shrapnel coming up on all sides, and we're like, that's not good. And there's little bits of fiber um, of styrofoam floating by. It's like, okay. Uh, Andrew asks, do you find a difference in keeping wine on the boat as compared to the RV, like humidity or bottle tapping each other? So we actually have a wine storage system. Do you want to show it to them, how we keep our wine? It, no, it's, no. It's, okay. it's, we'll, it's we'll mess do, in there, yeah. Yeah, we'll do a, a video in the future about some of the domestic things that we've chosen for the boat. But we actually have a crate system for our wine. We use it on the bus as well as the uh, the boat. Um, and basically it stores the wine nicely separated from each bottle. And it can also go upright. So if we're really expecting some rough seas or something, uh, we can just put it upright. Um, but mostly it stores... Uh, yeah, it's in yeah. the cabinet. Uh, the crates that we use are in our gear page on the uh, uh, technomadia.com. Uh, so as far as storing the bottles has not been a problem. As far as humidity and keeping wine, that's never a problem. Because <laughs> they wine... don't last. <laughs> yeah, they say the wine in the box will last seven days, and I've never seen it last no, more than like... six weeks. Six weeks? Oh, I've never seen it last more than like seven days, yeah. five days, yeah, three we, days. It's, we, it's... we only buy as much wine as we're going to consume in the next week, so um, we don't... We, we're not wine connoisseurs, connoisseurs. We're not storing special bottles or anything like that, so... Uh, we gave up on that a long time ago. Um, yeah, Edward would like to know, is there anywhere that we want to go in the water that we can't with the Bayliner? And, you know, this boat is, we specifically purchased it because it's ideal for intercoastal waterways, rivers, yeah. lakes, the things that we're going to be doing on the Great Loop. We, we actually did some really shallow waters. We kind of pushed ourselves on our trip down from um, Fort Myers here. We, we went through the Estero Bay, which... You know, we had inches underneath us, but we did a lot of homework and plotted the route and took it really slow and paid attention to our squinty little depth finder and went through some very shallow waters. But it would be, you know, I guess the biggest thing, concern I have with our boat is our propellers are the lowest point. So other boat designs have the keel be the lowest point. So if you end up sitting on the bottom, it's not a big deal. You're not damaging your propellers or, or your, your drive shafts. And... You know, if, if I could design, redesign the underside of this boat, I wish it had the propellers up and the keel be the lowest point. But, you know, this is this design is a really good compromise for our style of travel. And I can't think of any place that we really want to go that this won't be able to take us. Mm -hmm. uh, Christine asked if we've done a video tour of the boat, and actually we've done two. So if you uh -huh. look in the, uh, the boat content playlist, we have the initial tour from the day we first moved aboard. And we did a four-month follow-up going through the changes we've done and the projects that we yep. have or that we're planning. And, and then once we tackle another big round of projects, we'll probably do another updated tour. But yep. So go check the, the channel page. You'll see I have a playlist yes. specifically on boat content with that sort of information. Uh, Jay Mann wants to know, has the cat caught any critters on the boat? Mice <laughs> climb ropes. And actually, we have a, our first mouse. Yes. Oh, goodness. This, you know, we, we've been. She's caught a couple lizards and stuff, but... Cherie went to get her breakfast bar the other day and called me and was like, Hi, uh, there's bites in this. I'm like, that wasn't me. And we turned, ended up pulling open the cabinet, and apparently the mouse likes mashed potatoes and likes to take one bite out of every possible bag and leave a little hole in it. So 
We had to throw out a lot of food yesterday, two days ago. We bought some mouse traps, and we opened up a lot of cabinets and have been putting the cat on patrol. And she's been patrolling all night. She's like, ah, I got a job to do, but she hasn't caught the mouse yet. So, yeah, our first mouse event is happening right, right as now. we speak. Right now. Okay. Um, have you decided on the southwest uh, loop to do Mississippi or the Tennessee River? So traditionally oh. with the loop, you do a little bit of the Mississippi, then you go off to the Ohio and Tennessee. Yeah, the Ohio and Tennessee. The lower Mississippi is kind of the advanced uh, course. Um, it's there's it's a very long way without fuel and it's apparently very beautiful. If you want a, the kind of a great chronicle of it, um, check out our Odyssey. Um, Sean, Sean and, and Sean Louise, Louise, they, 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 they just did, did it this last, last year. Um, not a lot of cruisers do the lower Mississippi, so it's definitely the route less traveled. Um, I don't know whether we'll have, you know that's way years away for us. I don't know whether we'll probably do the Tennessee and whether we end up going back at some point and doing the Mississippi. I have no idea. The you know, I'm mostly excited to go past St. Louis because that's my old hometown. Um, do you sleep better on the boat or the RV? I think it depends if we're at anchor or not. <laughs> True, yes. In general, the boat, you know, the little motion is very relaxing. I love the water sounds and the little but rocking. I, I don't have trouble sleeping in either. We, we set up good mattresses yes. in both, and mm -hmm. we have a video that we did earlier this summer on mattresses for boats and RVs. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I sleep well in both, uh, but the I, boat the boat definitely has a special magic with the the, the constant gentle yeah. rock. And when you're anchored out on the calm night and you hear the little shrimps nibbling on the boat, oh, that's, that's so actually really cool. magic. Yeah, so cool. it, it, I, I don't know if that's good for the bottom of the boat or not, but you hear these things nibbling on you, <laughs> and it's just kind of this like little soothing little <laughs> clicking noise, and it just kind of lulls you to sleep. It's 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 kind of nice. I guess that's like some nights you have like the cicadas outside in the RV and you've got the yeah. air windows open and it's like magic as well. So yeah, that outdoor remote magic is kind of nice either yeah, way. Spiritual. And it, it, they're yeah. all awesome in yeah. its own way. Um, do you have an offsite physical media backup rotation for the physical mail? And uh, actually, we keep physical hard drives at um, parents. So whenever we visit them, we swap drives with them. Mm -hmm. uh, we can also ship one to our mail forwarding service and just have them store it as a box there and ship it to us if we need it as that. But yep. between the, the frequency that we see, both of our parents were able to swap and, our media And then our, our, our most critical files, we keep in Dropbox, so they're synced live and they're always backed up. Um, and I, at one point I was experimenting with Crash Plan is using that as backing up to a cloud backup service over unlimited cellular plans. and. I wasn't impressed with Crash Plan's flexibility to adjust to low bandwidth stuff. I've, if I were to try again, I think I would experiment with um, Carbonite. I think it's no, not Carbonite. Uh, Backblaze is the the top of my list of offsite backup services I'd experiment with. But I current we're currently not using one. We just use the drive drop method. method. Um, let's see. How about productivity on your regular job, uh, boating versus? Boondocking, that's an excellent question. It is. Yeah. Um, so our, our regular job is we run RV Mobile Internet and Marine is going to be a student. Mobile, mobile Internet, Internet Info, Info is the kind of umbrella site now. Um, so when we need to do intense work, like writing a book or producing a new guide or something like that, we specifically put aside time for that. And when we're RVing, we would definitely consider a boondocking site for that time because we our energy management is down pat. We're not worried about waves and dinghy yes. and anchors and things like that. I don't think that I would plan one of our intense work periods for anchoring out. Unless not, it's a nice protected harbor. Yeah, not, not until we get more experience with it, because right now it's still too new, still too much energy. Management. We did get a lot of work done during our, our week of cruising down here, I and mean, we, we actually were very productive, but um, it's still, we weren't, we weren't set up for a week in one place or something to really buckle down right. on work. And we weren't planning, we, we just were doing you know, answering our forum questions and we got some keep, articles done. We got some articles stories. Done, yeah, yeah. We, we, we weren't we, doing we, like intense 67 right. hour work weeks. Yes. Well, I hope we just avoid those in general. That'd be good. That would be good. Yes. Okay. That would be good. But yeah, um, we <laughs> are in the middle of, we're you know, approaching rewriting our mobile internet handbook right now. And uh, when we get ready to really, really focus on it, we'll probably be in a marina for that extended, yep. um, mm -hmm. just because of the state that we're in with our, we don't want to be in a learning mode. And, and also, also we don't have good power autonomy yet. Yes, so. and we need air conditioning to work that much. <laughs> um, somebody asks if we have a, an alternative to the dinghy as an emergency raft, Winnie the Pups asks. Um, we have an inflatable kayak, which would take not, a long time, not no, an emergency. Have, we have life jackets, lots of life jackets, lots of life jackets, throw pillows. Where we have inflatable the, wine boxes. 
Yes. Uh, so where we're going, we're mostly going to be inside of land. And, and probably, warm water. Warm water. Um, we're not going to be doing, you know, we're not having to be as concerned about hypothermia. Um, so, yes, we could get a life raft um, or one of these self-expanding ones. Um, there's really not a convenient place to store it on this boat. Probably at the top of the, the fly deck stairs, yeah. or something. We could. And it is consideration. Yeah, if, but if, if we, when we get to the point of doing the Caribbean, then it oh, certainly makes sense. It's, it's definitely. like once we're, once we're heading far out of sight of land then if, and, and or if we are like going up into Nova Scotia or something, we decide to, to go looping mm -hmm. up in cold water. Yeah, it's great to have something as an emergency backup. Mm -hmm. But right now, we're pretty covered, particularly because we have the easy access, quick deploy dinghy that can be in the water in mm -hmm. 10 seconds. And we're in warm waters. Yes. Those those two yes. factors, <laughs> and, and mostly protected waters, so yep. those factors all combined have not made it a high-priority task to look at getting a, a, a life raft. An offshore life raft, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Paul says, do you feel like you're more relaxed being on the water as opposed to being on the road? You both look really good. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> um, um, I think the relaxation is not just coming from boat versus RV, but having the getting out of the... Because we were in research mode for almost a year to get to the boat and in travel burnout mode. Yeah, and we 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 had... We, we, we had dialed up a lot of projects over the years, and we're kind of trying to dial them back. Um, and I think we're doing a better job this past year of just keeping ourselves in balance. And it doesn't have anything to do with boat versus RV. It's just a little bit more focusing on balance. Definitely balance. But I think also just having the, the boat transition done. Done, yes. And be solidly on this path. And I think, you know, there's always that... Trans you're, in, you're in that transition phase. There's it's a lot of chaos. Of you're in this in between stage. You don't want to invest more emotionally, financially, or anything into your current mode of life while you're searching for your next. And then you've got the transition itself. So I think just the mere fact of being over that hump is also leading to. But definitely, yeah. I compared to this time last year, I definitely feel much more oh, yeah. relaxed in general. And the time the year before? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, yes. And, you know, a lot of a lot uh -huh. of the chaos of launching a business, yeah. being done with two major projects. And, and we had been through so much stress with our bus remodel that that, two years that ago. nearly oh. destroyed us. And, yeah, the, that was such a disaster. And, yeah, we had so many things that became big stress balls. And mm -hmm. we're trying to avoid them. You know, knock on fiberglass, you know. All right. Um... Uh, hey, Maine Bob. I saw Curtis was on there, too. Yes, he was. Yeah. Ah, uh, so uh, Maine, uh, Maine Bob reminded us that it was a year ago that we arrived at China Lake in Maine. <gasps> yes. Oh, my gosh. Uh, yes. yes, it was. And, Beautiful uh, place. Beautiful place. I don't think our boat can get up to China Lake, but we can get to Maine. Get to Maine, and we can get the bus back up. It was amazing. Uh, yes. They invited us to camp on their land, and it was mm -hmm. an amazing experience meeting uh, Lynn and Bob. Uh and RV Adventures as they join Patreon. Thank you so Thank much you. for that. Uh, we, we really appreciate yeah, is, not because, that the financial support. The support the financial support is awesome because YouTube really doesn't pay that much. But the supportive it's, community it's, is it's, what's it's important. It's more that people are willing to put their, their, their name and their connection saying, hey, we want to be part of this community is great. You know, be we, part we, of we our, our circle of friends. Yeah. It, it gets lonely on the road sometimes, when, especially when we're... And, and, and we love doing these kind of like anonymous broadcasts to the big world. But, but we want to have a little bit more of a chance to feel like we're getting to know people. So so we'll still do these, but we like having mm -hmm. that option of having uh, closer connections with people. So thank you. And this experiment, you know, may hopefully it works, and mm -hmm. we're looking forward to it. Uh-huh. What Let's... gave you guys the idea to YouTube your life? Um, so... <laughs> <laughs> We, Shri, Shri can't help but blog. So we were both bloggers when we met 11, 11 years, years ago. ago yeah. And actually... Uh, Tuesday is, right? Wednesday is our 10-year commitment ceremony. Yes, at Burning Man 10 years ago is when we kind of, like, decided to make our temporary experiment permanent. So we were both on LiveJournal, if you're familiar with that old blogging platform. Way uh, before Facebook. When we met as, as personal social bloggers. Um, so we both were already in the long-term habit of sharing our lives with a community online. Um, so we started Technomadia.com as a blog that was a joint place for yeah. both of our posts yeah. to go. And basically, initially, Technomadia.com was just a little script that combined posts that each of us made on LiveJournal that were tagged with Technomadia into one place. So we can kind of a joint combo blog. And it evolved from there. 
and YouTube is just yeah. Kind so of so yeah, YouTube just when YouTube came about, we started a channel. Like, like when Twitter came about, Facebook came about, we just reserved the name Technomadia and started them there. And um, let's see, well, in two thousand nine, we got involved with one of the very first iPhone apps called Hear Planet, which they did audio tour guides to the world. Oh, that's right. Yeah, and there was also that travel channel. Thing yeah, some had. travel thing that hired us to do little travel videos. So, and we just started doing little travel snippets, like there was like four minute things and things we I'm saw. Not even sure was, what our oldest YouTube video is. Is it the Space Shuttle launch? Maybe. I don't know. It goes way uh, before it goes that. Before that, yeah. We started our YouTube channel. I want to say it was two thousand nine, ish. I don't know. It, it, it was just kind of like a random place to throw sort of videos on occasion. And that didn't do anything. I mean, YouTube was so small back then. And then we started. Um, Oh, we were presenting a lithium battery seminar at a bus rally. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And we decided, oh, the bandwidth was good. And I think at that time it was Ustream was one of the first yep. like live streaming so applications. So we, we just did an impromptu live recording of it just and to share with people who weren't there. It was like they wanted to see this seminar we were giving. And it archived. So we said, oh, we got this YouTube channel. We'll just put it there. And we said, oh, this, this live casting thing was kind of fun. And that's where <laughs> this sort of live cast idea came from from us. And um, so we just started push, putting the archives on YouTube, and suddenly we realized we had people watching us for an hour or two at a time. And people are telling, you know, YouTube was contacting us saying, you need to change your strategy. You can't do videos more than 15 minutes. I'm like, okay, mm. so we tried videos less than 15 minutes. There are a heck of a lot of work to edit, edit a video down to 15 minutes. But right. yet our long-form content is what always got the most views people, and the most appreciation. People seem to like hanging out and chatting like this. So, hey, you know, we're good. I mean, we, we've, we're actually kind of experimenting with the great looping of doing a lot more a lot. life video. So we're, we're, we're spending a lot more time, instead of taking photos, taking little video clips, little 10-second, 8-second clips, and then and compiling, compiling them into them. something. Yeah, and we're, we've now playing with the drone footage, which has been really fun. Um, but again, it's it's a lot more work to put those kind of videos together. Oh, yeah. I mean, like but doing this archive kind of is no problem. The last travelogue video took me eight hours to put together. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, okay, is it worth my time to do this? I'm doing it because I want to document this journey for us. So that's our prime motivation. Right. And that you guys can follow along is awesome, yeah, too. Uh, yeah. All right. <laughs> okay, that was a long thing. Uh, John wants to know, what is our Wi-Fi antenna on the boat? We don't use Wi-Fi, so... Um, we, we actually do have a Wi-Fi Ranger uh, um, um, mobile TI, I believe, mm -hmm. actually, because the Elite's mounted on the, the bus permanently. So we do have a, we do have a Wi-Fi Ranger, and our last but, marina was very fast. But we use cellular as our yeah. main, main the, way online. So right here in um, Marathon... I'm getting over 70 megabits per second on Verizon, AT&T, and T-Mobile. Sprint's like 4 or 5 megabits per second, but th three carriers over 70 megabits per second. It's just ridiculous. So we've got so much amazing unlimited cellular that we hardly ever think about Wi-Fi. Yep. Um, Dan wants to know our Patreon ID. It's Technomadia. Technomadia. Yeah, easy to find. Yep. And there's a link on our channel, too, if you can't yeah. find it. Um, Marsha wants to know if you hooked up with others making the Great Loop, will that community be as welcoming as the RV community? Uh, we've met up with the Great Loop community. We went to Looper Palooza last February. Before we got our yeah. boat. We're currently off season for the Loop, so there's not many loopers in this area other than those preparing. Uh, we have not honestly met up with many of them. And but the ones we have, you know, we, we've been, met some great loopers so far, yeah. Yeah, we're finding the community to be awesome, we're finding boaters to be welcoming and awesome. Uh, but boating is also a little more solitary than RVing. It's a little more, you need to be a little more self-sufficient, I think. But yet, boaters also look out for each other. Yeah, yeah, there's so a lot of looking it's out a, for each other, too. Mix. Yeah, so we're, we're, still, we're still newbies in the boating community. That, like, here in Marathon, even though it's off-season, every morning at 9 a.m., there's a radio channel, a VHF channel that people tune into and share announcements and trivia and everything. It's a little marathon radio net that is kind of the core of the cruising community here. We've we've not interacted on it yet, but we've listened in, and it's like, wow, this is kind of an interesting social vibe all happening over VHF. Um, so, yeah, the boating community is really awesome, and a, a lot of loopers um, connect with each other. The problem with, that we have with community, with loopers, is it's hard to find like minds as much. Because just like RVing when we started 11 years ago, it was mostly retirees. And it was rare to find working-aged right. folks uh, who were RVing. And now it's very commonplace for there to be working-aged RVers. And there's much more community opportunities. Right. So we've kind of gone backwards in yeah, that. Because now that we're, we're, we're finding it very rare to find other working on the road, working on the water, younger, um, non-retired 
loopers and, yeah. and cruisers. They're, They're out, out there, there. They're but rare. there's not. But it's, it's just uh, rare. It's, it, it's yeah, it, it's, it's like now it feels like the, the RVers are, are, are they're just coming out of the woodwork. It's, the, everybody is a working Everyone's, on the road yes. RVer, which is great. I love it. I mean, I totally love seeing yeah. that dynamic change. Yeah, because it definitely <laughs> wasn't that way when we started. Yes. <laughs> uh, somebody asked, how old are we? Someone, oh, how uh, yeah, we're, um, I just turned 44. You're 45. Four. We're both 45 right now. No, oh, we're, we're both, both 40, 44 right now. 44. Yeah, you turned 45 in November. Okay, yeah, November. We're exactly... So Interesting fact about us, if you want to know interesting fact about us, we are exactly nine months apart. We <laughs> have talked with both our parents. I was conceived the day he was born. They, they, her parents kept meticulous notes, apparently. So, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, interesting fact about us. <laughs> you, know, you won't find that on the blog. Um, have you done any night boating yet? I mean, we're on the boat all the time, but have we actually moved the boat at night? No, at not night? yet. No. <laughs> looking, looking forward to that, because I always used to love when, back when I was boating way back when i love boating at night i love flying an airplane at night i love that night navigation it's magic to me so i'm looking forward to our first night boating experience but it's no rush um let's see our opinion about ios versus windows uh richard we are completely 100 percent apple fanatics i i've used them all um, I used to used to go both ways, but now I'm really mostly Apple. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, what is the best bus frame for an RV conversion? Um, if you're starting from scratch right now, I mean, it depends on your budget. I mean, or something. Prevo, I don't know if you're starting if you're if you're buying a frame from the factory, I'd get a Prevo. But, but you know, you know if otherwise, you're buying a, uh, something that's used, just whatever you get. As far as best, I mean, define best. Uh, <laughs> we did do a uh, a video chat. I want to say it was about almost two years ago. It was uh, about old versus new RV. Look for that in the live playlist. And you might want to go look back at that. We suggested some of the best older RVs to uh, start with. Um, uh, Paul would like to know, are we able to write off most of our boat and RV expenses because of the business? And no. We don't even try. We probably could if we had a creative accountant, but it's not it's, really our priority. It's, it's, it's number one a gray area because there's not a lot of precedence for it. But if you don't own a physical home base that you're traveling from, the IRS considers, considers your tax home base to be where you currently are, which is in your RV or your boat. So you can't write off travel expenses because of that, um, because you're not traveling away from your home base. Mm -hmm. And then it also gets complicated that to write off office space, you have to have a dedicated office area, and that's really hard to claim in a small space because we do not have dedicated office. I'm sitting, my, my computer is here where I do work at, but this is also where I'm doing this personal life chat. It, where it's I our living dinner. room, yes. Yeah. It, it's, so, so we don't try to get creative or fancy with trying to do crazy write offs. But if you stuff. want to know more about that, the Escapees RV Club, wonderful organization for RVers, and I hope one day they cover cruisers too. If Travis is out there, please. Yes. Um, <laughs> Um, they have a CPA that is writing a series of articles about these topics explicitly. So go to their articles and blog section. It is a free their free content uh, and look and their accounting and financial tips. And you'll find that series. And it, it'll be eye opening. Mm -hmm. um, um, Jonathan wants to know if we're going to configure the boat for going blue water and going to the Bahamas. This boat actually used to go to the Bahamas all the time. That's what the prior owner's main thing was. Was a year once every so year often trip to the Bahamas. Um, right now, our focus is the loop, but eventually we'll probably take it to the Bahamas. It doesn't need much special configuration extra for that. You know, we probably yeah, get Bahamas a life raft. is fine, but yeah. go, going beyond that, the the Bayliner is not. It's not a blue water boat. We did find one Bayliner that did some cruising off of like the Sea of Cortez down into Mexico, and it was outfitted with flopper stoppers and all these other gear yeah. that I don't know much about. Yes. I just know the words. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, it's bay liner is meant exactly for the word bay yes. that that's its primary focus is right. the bay and uh if we ever did feel compelled to do more offshore stuff we would There's look much better boats for yes. that yes so uh, robert asked if we saw the dome home south of naples and everglades i saw them on google earth whenever i'd go any place i fly around in uh, google earth and and scope out wikipedia articles and i read about these dome homes and they're amazing the history and story behind them when we cruise near that area, it's super shallow water, so we couldn't be very close, but I think I saw them in the distance in my binoculars. They're on the edge of falling into the ocean. They're basically already a mile out to sea because the sand underneath has been washed away. But yeah, search for a dome home, Naples, or uh, Cape Romano, dome home Cape Romano, some really fascinating history of this old house. 
getting reports that we're already up to 18 Patreons. Thank you guys who have decided to join that. Awesome. That is beyond wow. any expectations or, that Thank I you. have. We're really excited to form more of a closed community. Um, yeah. And, and having a place to share more of the laughter and cry a little sometimes when things aren't yeah. going Yeah, because, yeah. We do feel like when we're doing the big public stuff and the stuff that's archived and in the public eye, we are, we're informal, we share a lot, but we do have to have a little bit of the breaks on. And so maybe yeah. having patrons, maybe having yeah, that like will the, be able the, to be the night little little we bit. had that really rough weather, I would have liked to share with someone yeah. without the criticism of, you stupid people, you shouldn't be out there. You know, yeah. I just, I don't want to face that. Yeah, when, when you have the anonymous drive-bys, it can be a little, you, you, you put the brakes on, and you, we, deal, we deal with them pretty well. I mean, but, you know, it's just, it'd be nice to have that safe community of people we know are already literally on our side. So, hey, yeah. we'll, we're, yeah. it's going to be fun to try. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It's yeah. something I've wanted for a while, and I'm just so resistant to Patreon because... For me, it's not about funding this content creation. I'm right. going to do it anyway. Right, because yeah, so so many of the other patrons, and we love this as a model for them. This is their business, and we think this is a great way for people who are, you know, going off like the winds. Who are like their job is video production, and they set up cameras and they set up shots and they do really cool things. Um, and it's worth you know go go subscribe to their patron and pay them if you if you enjoy watching their stuff or Delos. I mean, Delos is kind oh. of the gold standard of. The SV Delos channel is amazing, and they do that. It's they're well worth it. They're better than anything on TV, short of Game of Thrones, which is on in half an hour, by the way. Oh yeah, that's um, right. We signed up for seven, <laughs> so we'll be wrapping this up but, soon. Yes. So, but yeah, so there's some really awesome stuff on Patreon, and they, they people are paying like two hundred dollars a month for some like premium tiers on some of these channels. We really don't want that. We, we, if somebody wants to pay us $200 well, a month, that's fine. well, thank you. We're not going to say no, but... We, we'll buy us some wine and toast your name, but we, but we don't want to have tears, and we don't want to have all that other Well, we stuff. might do tears later. Maybe I don't know. Maybe someday we We'll will, see how it goes. We'll but see how it goes. We wanted to start off with, like, hey, let, let's just hang out. Yep. So, um, <laughs> So, Krul, you have asked now, like, 20 times how long we've been on YouTube, and I have answered it. <laughs> if you go to our About screen on our channel, you'll see the exact date we signed on. Yes. I think it was sometime in 2009. We've been on YouTube a very long time. Um, we have not put focus on YouTube except for in like the last two years. Yes. So, uh, what do we do for a cheap date night? <laughs> we watch Game of Thrones, right? That we got, date, or we host a live video chat with wine. <laughs> cheap date night. Go for we. I don't know. We just we, go we, out. Yeah, we, I mean, we, we go for we go for hikes, and and we don't do a lot of f fancy date nights. Is not something we really do. Actually, even if we if we wanted to, it's it's like we. For us, a, a great date night is curling up and watching a really cool movie. Like Game of Thrones in thirty minutes. Or Game of Thrones, like you know, it's, it, the the title of tonight's episode is is the uh, um the the dragon and the wolf. I mean, are Daenerys and John finally going to hook up, or is this going to be about where John's parents can't hooked up? You know, this this could be either way. This is exciting stuff. It's a season finale. I mean, thirty minutes from now. <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay. Let's see. Some last. Things here. How do we access the real time tracker? So if you join Patreon, I put a link up to our Garmin inReach, and uh, the the password is on there. So if you click the link, put in the password, you should be able to see the track. Uh, we're only going to be broadcasting that when we're actually in motion, and we've been still in marathon for a week now. So right. so so it stops a week ago because we just don't leave it turned on when we're not moving. But it's you should you should see the path from Fort Myers yeah. down. Yep, to it here. has every every ten minutes from mm -hmm. actually every minute because I've done a full full data yeah. set. So every minute of where we've been from Fort Myers to here, you can see our route through the uh -huh. e everything. There are still two hundred people hanging out with us. I know that this is this is kind of cool. Yes, um, let's see. Um, Jerry, this is a great comment. Um, I enjoy your chats. Very intelligently done with your peripatetic lifestyle. And thank you for using the big words. Um, <laughs> and it is as interesting, educational, fun as it must be. Do you feel a lack of community, place, and family? And I have to say, um, lack of community was the hardest thing for me for the first couple of years on the road. I left a very vibrant, involved community in Florida. You had one in San Francisco. I, yeah, I, I, that was that was a tough thing because I had I had my people and I had my things I did every week with my people, and hitting the road it, that was the hardest thing to drag me from California because I still kept looping me back to San Francisco at first. For this event, that event, uh, and uh, I had to, I had to like extract myself from California, and it was tough to do. But now we've got so many nomadic friends who are kind of in the same sort of thing that. 
like like we were talking at the very beginning of this chat about uh, Nina and Paul and wheeling it, and we've seen them in so many different states. And there's like we've got other nomadic friends that we've seen in so many different states. But it it's is a different kind of separation. It now. is a very different type of community because, you know, we we saw Nina and Paul last in April before they started heading up the north coast, and now they're going west. Uh, we, we probably might, won't we see them when... for a year. Yeah. We keep in touch, but we do FaceTime chats and stuff. It, it's and not the same as being there and, in person. And like Peter and John, it's been forever since we've seen them because they're way up in the northwest and we're way down in the southeast. And it's and and like Curtis, you know, we was here. Hey, we see see the people online. And it's not quite the same as you know getting a. Yeah. We the, do FaceTime chats with our friends and yeah. family. It's, um, it's different in this. And stuff. you know, one reason we picked the Great Loop is because our parents are both along it, so we'll get time with them. My mother's going to cruise <laughs> with us for parts parts of it. But, yeah, we've yeah. had her mom on board three times now. Yeah, it's been it's awesome. awesome. It's been awesome. But I do miss that daily interactive community, that more sense of an extended family feel. And you get it for bits on the road. And there are RVers that have made that community yeah. on the road. We have not made well, it we, extended. We, we, we've had, like, like well, we had, like, a six-month extended caravan with, with Nina, Nina Paul, Paul once. And we've had other, like, major mm -hmm. extended gatherings. And it just feels like you've got your own city of your, your people together, like the Escapers Convergence two years ago. Um... So it happens, but then it then it ends, and then it happens again, and then it ends. So it's it's a very different rhythm, and that is one of the biggest differences with this kind of lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So yes, community is tough, and it's very different. And I I used to feel that community would be the thing that took me off the road, but some of our community is mobile now. But I and longer stays are difficult. Like in Fort Myers, we we're there for three months, and it got to a point of Okay, do we start investing in friendships and relationships here locally, or do we move on? Right. Because it, it's a tough balance, because after you're, you're somewhere for a, pl a place starts to become related to the people there. Right. And uh, So, yeah, it's a tough balance. Yep. I'm not, I'm not going to lie about that. <laughs> um, That's uh, a lot of great comments here. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, what is your favorite meal to have on a boat? Do you like to cook? I wax and lean if I like <laughs> yeah. to cook. Like, little random... Oh, we lost the light. Hopefully yes. it's still bright enough. Yes. Um, Shree, like, says, I'm going to make something really quick, and then she comes out with something amazing, like this ricotta bake she made the other day in, like, three minutes. It was incredible. Yeah, that was 30 minutes. Well, yeah. So, yeah, you started... I was like, I'm going to make something really quick, and then it turned into this incredible meal. Um... But other times we're just like we want quick and easy. We're we're not super fancy cooks. Yeah, I mean one often. of our one of our basic meals is uh, black beans and rice. Yes. So I use a rice cooker. I put the rice in. I put a can of black beans, or if we've made black beans, I put those in. Can of rotel, some water, and let it bubble up. Then I put some cheese, and then we put our favorite salsa on it, which is uh, uh, that Costa Rican thing. Yeah, lasagna. Lasagna. It's, yeah, it's awesome. not a regular salsa. It's amazing. But, um, oh yeah. Yeah, and we, we love grilling fish, doing fish tacos. Yes, yeah, so we've been doing fish tacos and uh, those little fish salads a lot lately. Uh -huh. And that is not copying the winds. They just happen to have great taste, too. Uh, <laughs> and, but they catch their fish. We're, yes. not, we're not into yeah, the fishing game. We're not that, that, that endeavors. Um. Um, <laughs> all right. Ah, okay, okay so all... I'm, we need to get wrapped up. This, we have we, almost two hours. And, and there's Game of Thrones coming up. Yeah. Yes. Um... We're going to watch it in HD, stream. Yes, we are. Someone did ask about it. We do have unlimited cellular data plans. It's yes. online. So many want, unlimited cellular data plans coming out of our want, ears. If you want to know more about cellular unlimited data, go to rvmobileinternet.com slash unlimited, and you'll read all about those. We track them very closely. Yeah, that's our, that's our work life, and we give mm -hmm. a lot of advice on how to stay connected. Um, it can be done. You can stream Game of Thrones in HD while living on the road, and we've Tons of advice there. That We don't cover that in our personal chats, though. That's yes. the, over the other side of the world. All right. So thank you guys for joining <laughs> this evening and hanging out for so long with us. Um, oh, my God. Thank you to those of you that choose to become Patreons this evening. That That's just a, wow. seriously yeah. warms my heart. And um, we're going to go watch Game of Thrones. And we look forward to more casually <laughs> sharing with Patreons in the future. And it doesn't mean we're not going to do random YouTube like we, this as well. So we will still do these topical ones. Yes. So. Uh-huh. Okay. Good night, guys. Good night. Good night. I do stop.